production of WFCR Amherst. This is Spectrum. Good afternoon. I'm Kari Jiri. On today's program is former Senator George McGovern, who spoke recently at Smith College in Northampton on the nuclear arms race. McGovern's political life began like so many others, in academia. At 21 years of age, he left college to join the Air Force during World War II. He returned after the war to finish his undergraduate degree. And following graduation, McGovern decided to train for the ministry and joined a seminary, but left after nine months to return to school for postgraduate studies. He received his Ph.D. in History and Government at Northwestern University and eventually began teaching those subjects there, where he also coached the debating team. Following his quest for a more active political life, he helped organize the Democratic Party in South Dakota, and at 33 years of age, he ran successfully for the U.S. House of Representatives, where he served two terms. In 1960, President-elect John F. Kennedy appointed McGovern to be the first director of the United States Food for Peace program. In 1962, he began a three-term career at the U.S. Senate, and during his 18 years there, he served on the Joint Economic Committee, the Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry Committees. He chaired the Senate Select Committee on Nutrition and Human Needs, also serving on the Foreign Relations Committee, where he chaired its subcommittee on African Affairs. McGovern is probably best known for his winning the Democratic Party's nomination for president in 1972. Only Massachusetts voted for him. The rest of the country voted for Richard Nixon. In 1984, McGovern again ran for the Democratic Party's nomination for president, campaigning for a decrease in defense spending and military withdrawal from Lebanon and Central America. Since September, McGovern has been teaching foreign policy at Duke University. George McGovern's address at Smith College was recorded on February 27, 1985, and his comments are timely in light of recent events in Central America. I uh, have been asked to speak on the nuclear war issue. First, I'd like to just make brief mention about another uh, issue that's very much on my mind these days. When I got into the uh, presidential effort in uh, 1984, I did it not only because of the nuclear issue, which was being addressed by some of the other contenders, but also because of certain other issues that were not being addressed. For example, uh, on a list of 10 steps that I recommended the uh, next president of the United States uh, take, uh, outside of the nuclear freeze uh, issue, almost none of those other uh, issues on my list uh, were being discussed at all. And one of those, uh, step one, on my uh, agenda was a recommendation that the United States terminate any and all uh, military operations right now in Central America. I still believe that this would strengthen our standing in Central America and indeed uh, throughout the hemisphere and in much of the rest of the world if we would confine our efforts to influence events in Central America to uh, intelligent diplomacy, uh, an intelligent trade and uh, economic and technical assistance uh, program, and uh, to support uh, the organized uh, negotiating efforts that have been underway there for some time, the so-called uh, Contadora process. But I was astounded at this late date in our relationship to Central America uh, given the long history of unsatisfactory American military interventions over the decades in Central America, to hear the President of the United States say when he was asked uh, if there were conditions under which we might uh, back away from our military pressure on Central America or on Nicaragua, as the question meant, he said, well, uh, we might back away when we get them to say uncle. Uh, in a sense, uh, to knuckle under to uh, the kind of uh, intense pressure that we have been bringing to bear on that Sandinista government. Now, it seems to me that this uh, describes uh, the scope of our problem. Once again, conjuring up 
this old obsolete gunboat diplomacy uh, approach that has gotten us into so much difficulty uh, over the years in our relationships with these little countries uh, to the south of us. I'm quite prepared to concede that the Sandinista government in Nicaragua is not a model of Jeffersonian democracy. Uh, they have never claimed uh, to be that. But uh, any American military, ad American administration that can swallow uh, what's been going on at official levels in El Salvador uh, over the last uh, five or six years. Death squads that have killed, according to the Catholic bishops, uh, 30 to 40,000 innocent uh, non-combatants, uh, murdering people in their beds, on the streets, on the byways of that country. If we can swallow that kind of thing and indeed throw our arms around that government and back them uh, to the tune now of almost a billion dollars in military uh, assistance, I think uh, we ought to be able to uh, muster a little tolerance towards this revolutionary regime uh, in Nicaragua. It is, after all, a regime that came to power after overthrowing the uh, Somoza gang, one of the most corrupt and tyrannical uh, regimes in, uh, in all of uh, Latin America, and a regime, incidentally, uh, which followed the uh, American marine occupation of that country uh, some uh, 50 years ago. That was really the heritage that we left uh, Nicaragua, these uh, Somoza uh, people who, in addition uh, to uh, tyrannizing the country, stole everything in sight, uh, including the American earthquake uh, aid that we sent on a humanitarian basis uh, some uh, years ago, which was pilfered and used by uh, the Somozas for their own uh, personal uh, aggrandizement. So what I would ab appeal for here tonight, as I did during the uh, recent campaign, is that we terminate uh, these military operations uh, all across uh, Central America, but especially in Nicaragua, that we stop this uh, nonsense about waging a so-called secret war uh, in Nicaragua uh, to uh, sabotage and overturn that government. To whatever extent revolutionary governments have a tendency towards authoritarianism and towards uh, paranoia, you exacerbate all those tendencies when you engage in the kind of sabotage uh, that we have been uh, funding in uh, Nicaragua uh, in recent years. So I agree with the Speaker of the House from this state, Tip O'Neill, when he said on yesterday to the House of Representatives, instead of playing the role of an uncle trying to twist the arms of the people of Nicaragua to heed our particular will, we ought to begin playing the role of a brother. Uh, towards these uh, little countries to the uh, south of us, or what the late President Roosevelt called the good neighbor policy. How much better that would be in terms of our own interests if we were perceived uh, not as someone trying to make uh, the government of Nicaragua cry uncle, but as one following the course of the good neighbor in trying to come to terms with this young uh, revolutionary government and helping to uh, influence them in a, in a moderate and constructive direction. I can assure you that if part of our policy is to minimize uh, Soviet and Cuban influence in Nicaragua, and I think that's a legitimate objective uh, of American policy, we would be far more successful in that in trying to cooperate with the Sandinistas than in cooperating with this Contra uh, rebel group, which 90% uh, represents the old Somoza uh, regime. There are a few people in the Contra forces that are doubtless disillusioned uh, revolutionists who once were with the Sandinistas, but the overwhelming majority of these Contra forces are old discredited elements from the Somoza uh, National Guard and other elements of that regime that do not merit the backing and support uh, of the American people. And if you want to maximize 
Soviet and Cuban influence in Nicaragua, the best way to do it is to tie in with this discredited contra group against the revolutionary government that is now in power in Nicaragua, and which I'm convinced will still be there 10 or 20 years uh, into the future. That is the group with which we ought to be identifying American influence and power uh, in Nicaragua, rather than this hopeless uh, ragtag element to which we have attached our, our prestige and power. Well, so much for that. We're going to be observing uh, the 10th anniversary of the American pullout from uh, Vietnam. On April 30th, uh, 1975, the older people here in the auditorium will recall the pictures of uh, the American ambassador and the last Americans in uh, Saigon being uh, lifted off the roof of the embassy as we said goodbye uh, to a failing uh, war in which we had been uh, involved uh, for many years. Uh, when we have those 10th uh, year, uh, decade-long uh, observations uh, near the end of uh, April, uh, I hope we will think seriously about the lessons that that costly experience has to, to teach us. And one lesson uh, applies, in my judgment, to what's going on in Central America. And that is to avoid the mistake of assuming that you can divide the world into two uh, groups, uh, Moscow on one side and, wa and, uh, and Washington on the other. This kind of bipolar approach to all foreign policy uh, problems in which uh, the assumption is made uh, that if there's a revolution going on somewhere in the world, the Russians caused it. And therefore, it's in our strategic interest to oppose it. Now, that really is what happened uh, in Vietnam. We didn't see Ho Chi Minh as a nationalist attempting to throw off a hundred years of French imperialism, which is what he was trying to do, although admittedly a communist. We didn't see him as the man who stood with us in the war against Japan, although he did, and some of the uh, uh, some of my fellow pilots in World War II were rescued in the Southeast Asian jungle by Ho Chi Minh's underground and brought back to, uh, to American lines. I'm not under any illusions that he was a Jeffersonian Democrat. He was a communist and a hard-bitten one. But the fact remains that he was also a nationalist whose driving ambition in his life was to get other people out of his country, the foreigners, the French, the Japanese, and later uh, the Americans. But we had this bipolar view of the world. If there was a revolution going on uh, against the French, and it was being led by a communist or a Marxist, that had to be the Russians. Or worse yet, the Chinese, Peking. And so I think it's fair to say we went into uh, Vietnam and stayed there all those years because we thought we were turning back a challenge from Peking or Moscow or both. And we didn't look at the local conditions. We didn't look at the 100 years of French colonialism. We didn't look at the poverty and the, and the misrule. And I think the same thing's going on today uh, in Central America. You remember shortly after this administration came to power, four and a half years ago, Secretary Haig was then calling the shots in Central America. And he said of El Salvador and Nicaragua, these are the first two hits on the Soviet hit list for Central America. In other words, if we don't stand up in El Salvador, if we don't stand up in Nicaragua, the Soviet Union is going to take over the place, never recognizing the fact that Somoza's misrule in Nicaragua might have had more to do with that Sandinista re rebellion than anything that Moscow was doing. And I think those are the kind of uh, uh, considerations we have to, to have in mind if we're going to learn any lessons 
that Vietnam had to uh, teach us. I don't think you can form an intelligent American policy in Nicaragua if you don't know something about Somoza's 40-year uh, regime, if you don't know something about the role of American corporations in Central America and the impact of American military interventions. This is not a partisan analysis I'm making here. I don't think the Democrats have been much better than the uh, Republicans as far as their policy on uh, Central America uh, is concerned, although I must say Reagan has topped uh, a anybody that I can, I can think of at the moment in terms of mistakes uh, in, in Central America. But the point of all of this is that I think if we're to pursue uh, a common sense uh, policy in the world, we have to begin moving away from this kind of knee-jerk, bipolar uh, interpretation of what's going on in the world and begin to look at some of the indigenous circumstances that prompt these uh, upheavals and trouble spots around the globe. All right, well now let me move on to the nuclear question. Some uh, 40 years ago, uh, about this time of the year, uh, in 1945, I was the pilot uh, of a B-24 bomber operating against targets in Nazi Germany. We were coming near to the end of the war and I was uh, near the end of a string of uh, combat missions, and I really believed that I was flying the ultimate offensive weapon. Here was an airplane, it was the biggest one we had at the time, the B-24, 110-foot wingspan, and it could drop three or four tons of TNT from a single airplane. I couldn't imagine anything more destructive uh, than that, to put a thousand airplanes up in the air, each one with three or four tons uh, of TNT. But we had no sooner got back to the United States at the end of the European War when we read about the uh, bomb that destroyed uh, Hiroshima. It had the striking capacity not of three tons, but of, of 20,000 tons uh, in a single bomb. We dropped another one three days later on Nagasaki and the Japanese surrendered. I think we had three bombs in our arsenal at the time and two of them were enough uh, to bring Japan uh, to, its, to its knees. But today we have 10,000 of these strategic uh, nuclear weapons. I'm not talking about the intermediate uh, weapons, which are several times that number, but 10, 10,000 strategic weapons, uh, many of them with the destructive capacity not of 20,000 tons, like the one at Hiroshima, but some as much as 20 million tons in a single bomb, many of them a million tons. And the Soviets have about the same. But uh, uh, it seemed to me uh, when I began to read about uh, this new uh, weapon, that uh, Hitler uh, and his, his Nazi uh, legions uh, were a foe that we had to, uh, to bring down. I've never had any, uh, any doubt uh, about that. I still don't. But, um, uh, and I want to make clear tonight that because of that background, I'm, I'm not here uh, speaking as an isolationist. Uh, or even as a pacifist for that matter, although that's a perfectly respectable uh, position for uh, people to take. It's not one that I have ever uh, uh, been able to pursue. I do believe in, a, in an adequate uh, U.S. military uh, defense, and I believe we ought to play an active role in international uh, affairs. But I object to being uh, called an isolationist, as I was in the uh, last issue, issue of the New Republic uh, uh, magazine, a once liberal uh, publication, uh, <laughs> simply, uh, simply on the grounds that, uh, that uh, the editor of that magazine seems to believe that you test someone's internationalism uh, by the number of troops they want to dispatch into somebody else's uh, backyard. There's more to uh, uh, internationalism uh, than that. Now, what worries me most deeply these days is that we are led 
by leaders who apparently do not understand the new realities uh, of the nuclear age. I have, um, I've lived all of my life, uh, at least my public life, in the spirit of hope. Uh, it's the only way you can survive as a Democrat in South Dakota. Uh, <laughs> to, uh, uh, but but I, I know that, um, that the foundation of hope uh, is the willingness to confront uh, reality. And the reality that our leaders do not face, and I think the same is true with the Soviet leaders, is that uh, the nuclear bomb has changed everything very fundamentally about uh, international relations. Uh, I talked about the plane that I flew, and I do that not to to ballyhoo my own military experience, but simply to paint the contrast. When we were flying those bombing missions against the Nazis 40 years ago, if we had a mission where we lost 10% of the American planes on that mission, that was a catastrophic failure. Why? Because if you lost 10% of your planes every time you attacked an enemy target, within 10 days, the whole force would be gone. You wouldn't have any uh, uh, bombers uh, uh, left. Uh, but uh, today, the, uh, the H-bomb uh, can deliver uh, a million tons, or five million, or 10 million to a, a target. And uh, from that standpoint, uh, it doesn't uh, represent a failure if you lose 10% of the weapons that you're directing against a target, indeed, you send um, 100 missiles against a city the size of Boston, and if 99 of them are knocked down or never reach the target, and one of them hits the center of Boston, that city's gone. So that a mission can be a 99% failure and in terms of the results, it's 100% successful. And that is the, uh, one of the fundamental uh, differences. The only defense against uh, nuclear weapons uh, is deterrence against their use. Nobody's ever been able to devise a scheme under which the defense can overwhelm uh, the offense. And that is why the current uh, Star Wars uh, illusion is just that, the notion that somehow you could build an airtight shield against thousands of missiles being fired from the land, from submarines, from bombers, some, some cases smuggled into the uh, country, uh, is preposterous. I've tried to learn whether or not there are any recognized or respected scientists really working on this Star Wars uh, project, uh, and I can't determine that any are. I think that the, uh, the Star Wars concept is surely the ultimate product of the mad uh, scientist and the, uh, the Hollywood, uh, and the Hollywood uh, fantasy that sometimes uh, passes for policy these days. <laughs> now, that... That, uh, that, of course, in all fairness, is not the view of the Secretary of Defense uh, or of the President. Here is what Mr. Weinberger has to say about it in describing the President's attitude towards Star Wars. He says, and I'm quoting, it's the only thing that offers any real hope to the world, and the President will never give that up. Now, writing of the same... Star Wars uh, proposal in the winter uh, issue of the Foreign Affairs uh, Quarterly, uh, McGeorge Bundy, uh, George Kennan, uh, Robert McNamara, and Gerard Smith, uh, a Republican incidentally, these four men who have given a lifetime to the study of strategic and security issues, uh, they quoted uh, Senator Arthur Vandenberg's words to describe 
how they reacted to the Star Wars proposal. And this is what Senator Vandenberg said about a similar scheme 40 years ago. The end is unattainable, the means harebrained, and the cost staggering. Now the four authors conclude, and I, I want to quote them to be precise on this, there is simply no escape from the reality that Star Wars offers not the promise of greater safety, but the absolute certainty of a large-scale expansion of both offensive and defensive systems on both sides. And I think that's clear. If you're sitting on the other side, it doesn't make much difference which one starts this business. If you're sitting on the other side and you see your potential enemy begin to build a net that's supposed to intercept uh, incoming missiles, and you know that that enemy still has his offensive plans, he still has the capacity to destroy you, and he's building to the day when you can't presumably uh, hit him, what are you going to do? You're either going to try to build a defensive shield like that of your own, which means an enormous uh, expansion of the arms race on both sides, or you're going to try to overwhelm it with more offensive uh, weapons. And I think the latter course is probably the more uh, likely one uh, to, uh, to expect. It's my own uh, view that, that we've been living on borrowed time uh, for quite a while in the uh, nuclear age. On numerous occasions, our own nuclear alert system has gone into steps one, sometimes to step two, sometimes step three, on the basis of what we believed were incoming uh, Soviet missiles uh, or bombers. Now, each time those fears uh, proved to be mistaken, and progression towards a nuclear retaliation on our part uh, was halted. I think it's fair to assume that the same kind of nerve-shattering uh, misjudgments have been made by the Soviets. There's no reason to think that their detection system uh, is any more reliable uh, or foolproof uh, than ours. Indeed, the, the best evidence is that the Soviet air defense commanders shot down that uh, Korean jetliner a year and a half or so ago on the mistaken judgment that what they were shooting down was an American uh, intelligence plane. Uh, now, the point I would like to make, if they made that kind of a misjudgment, and our best intelligence has now concluded that it, that it was a mistaken judgment, they didn't really think they were knocking down an innocent uh, civilian airliner, if they made that kind of misjudgment after tracking that airplane for two hours, how much safer are we against that kind of misjudgment now that we have moved missiles up to within six minutes of the Soviet command and control centers where uh, an incoming missile has to be identified as a legitimate attack within six minutes and the response uh, planned and projected in that uh, period of time. I think the accumulation of nuclear weapons on both sides is pushing us closer and closer to the kind of hair-trigger uh, response that someday, if this process is continued, is going to... In 1984, McGovern again ran for his party's nomination for president, campaigning on, among other issues, a decrease in defense spending and military troop withdrawal from Lebanon and Central America. On last week's program, McGovern commented on what he believed was a short-sighted foreign policy in regards to Latin America and predicted that the eventual outcome of current policy will be the deployment of U.S. troops. He also spoke on the history of the current arms buildup between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. On today's program, George McGovern continues his talk by criticizing the President's Strategic Defense Initiative, otherwise called the Star Wars Proposal, in his address recorded on February 27, 1985. McGeorge Bundy, uh, George Kennan, uh, Robert McNamara, and Gerard Smith, uh, a Republican incidentally, these four 
men who have given a lifetime to the study of strategic and security issues, uh, they quoted uh, Senator Arthur Vandenberg's words to describe how they reacted to the Star Wars proposal. And this is what Senator Vandenberg said about a similar scheme 40 years ago. The end is unattainable, the means harebrained, and the cost staggering. Now the four authors conclude, and I, I want to quote them to be precise on this, there is simply no escape from the reality that Star Wars offers not the promise of greater safety, but the absolute certainty of a large-scale expansion of both offensive and defensive systems on both sides. And I think that's clear. If you're sitting on the other side, it doesn't make much difference which one starts this business. If you're sitting on the other side and you see your potential enemy begin to build a net that's supposed to intercept uh, incoming missiles, and you know that that enemy still has his offensive punch, he still has the capacity to destroy you, and he's building to the day when you can't presumably uh, hit him, what are you going to do? You're either going to try to build a defensive shield like that of your own, which means an enormous uh, expansion of the arms race on both sides, or you're going to try to overwhelm it with more offensive uh, weapons. And I think the latter course is probably the more uh, likely one uh, to, uh, to expect. But in any event, these four men representing both parties, former cabinet uh, officers, say it is possible to reach arms control agreements with the Soviet Union, or it is possible to insist on Star Wars, but it's wholly impossible to do both. And I think it's as simple as that. We can either halt this uh, arms race at this time and begin to pursue uh, a freeze on both sides, or we can launch off on some new destabilizing trillion dollar operation of this kind, and it means the end of any real hope for arms control or the peace of the world. Now, these four uh, authors quote the late President Andropov's reply four days after Mr. Reagan uh, made that so-called a Star Wars speech. And here is what the uh, late President Andropov said, uh, which, which is an indication, I think, of, uh, of Soviet reaction. He said, on the face of it, laymen may find it attractive as the President speaks about what seems to be defensive measures. But this may seem to be so only on the face of it and only to those who are not conversant with the facts. In fact, he said, the strategic offensive forces of the United States will continue to be developed and upgraded. And along that line, they will be attempting to acquire a first strike capability. Under these conditions, he said, the intention to secure itself the possibility of destroying with the help of the ABM defenses the corresponding strategic systems of the other side is a bid to disarm the Soviet Union in the face of the U.S. nuclear threat. Now that is precisely the way we reacted 20 years ago when the Soviets set out to build a defensive anti-ballistic missile system and our policy makers worked diligently in the Kennedy and Johnson years to convince them that it was destabilizing to try to threaten deterrence by building that kind of a defensive shield. And after years of work and persuasion, the Soviets uh, abandoned it. And now we are apparently bent on pursuing the same course that we once saw as so destabilizing. It's my own uh, view that, that we've been living on borrowed time uh, for quite a while in the uh, nuclear age. On numerous occasions, our own nuclear alert system has gone into steps one, sometimes to step two, sometimes step three, on the basis of what we believed were incoming uh, Soviet missiles uh, or bombers. Now, each time 
those fears uh, proved to be mistaken and progression towards a nuclear retaliation on our part uh, was halted. I think it's fair to assume that the same kind of nerve-shattering uh, misjudgments have been made by the Soviets. There's no reason to think that their detection system uh, is any more reliable uh, or foolproof uh, than ours. Indeed, the, the best evidence is that the Soviet Air Defense commanders shot down that uh, Korean jetliner a year and a half or so ago on the mistaken judgment that what they were shooting down was an American uh, intelligence plan, uh, plane. Uh, now, the point I would like to make, if they made that kind of a misjudgment, and our best intelligence has now concluded that it, that it was a mistaken judgment, they didn't really think they were knocking down an innocent uh, civilian airliner, if they made that kind of misjudgment after tracking that airplane for two hours, how much safer are we against that kind of misjudgment now that we have moved missiles up to within six minutes of the Soviet command and control centers where uh, an incoming missile has to be identified as a legitimate attack within six minutes and the response uh, planned and projected in that uh, period of time. I think the accumulation of nuclear weapons on both sides is pushing us closer and closer to the kind of hair trigger uh, response that someday, if this process is continued, is going to result in a tragic uh, miscalculation. We and the Soviets are, are building these weapons right now in February of 1985 at a rate of three each day on each side. This is the 27th of February. On the 27th of March, there will be another 90 uh, nuclear weapons in the American arsenal and presumably the same uh, on, the, uh, on the other side. So what then is the basis of hope in the nuclear age? I don't see any clear or singular route to uh, nuclear security, but I do see a number of hopeful signs that our salvation from nuclear annihilation is possible. And the most hopeful of these signs is the evidence that the overwhelming majority of the American people and of the Russian people do not want uh, a nuclear war. There are consistent reports from every thoughtful student I have talked to of the Soviet Union, American uh, students and experts on the Soviet Union, that the Russian people and their leaders still live with the horror of World War II uh, in their minds. I know that Americans, the older ones, remember World War II also. But what we remember is a war that we saw uh, in newsreels, in the theaters. We saw glimpses of it. We didn't have television in those days, but we'd see pictures of it in Life magazine. We'd read the news reports uh, in the press, or we'd hear Edward R. Murrow broadcasting from London over the uh, radio. In the Soviet Union, by contrast, 20 million people died in turning back that invasion of the Nazi uh, forces. It's very hard to find a, a Russian family that didn't lose somebody uh, in, that, uh, in that war. So I believe that uh, it's fair to, uh, to assume that there's a strong uh, potential for peace uh, inside this uh, totalitarian uh, country. Uh, I also believe that uh, for different reasons, the American people have a horror uh, of nuclear war. Every public opinion poll that I have seen in recent years indicates that a large majority of Americans support the concept of a mutual, verifiable uh, nuclear freeze. I think it's possible to negotiate that kind of an agreement 
uh, with the Soviet Union. I might say on, on that score that uh, when the delegates to the Republican National Convention in Dallas were surveyed on this question in the summer of 1984, 62% of the delegates to that convention said they favored the nuclear freeze, notwithstanding the fact the uh, platform went in a different uh, direction. I think there is almost majority support, if not majority support, for the nuclear freeze uh, in the Congress of the United States. And this is the battleground where I think you and I uh, should concentrate our efforts uh, in the near term. Notwithstanding its, uh, its flirtation with the uh, Star Wars illusion and its poor record on uh, arms negotiation in recent years, even the administration seems to be showing some uh, at least a modest uh, effort on the side of restraint uh, in its comments about the Soviet Union. Senator Goldwater, of all people, has called for cancellation uh, of the MX uh, missile and for a freeze on uh, military spending. Now, these things are encouraging. Last summer, right after the uh, Democratic National Convention, I journeyed to the uh, Soviet Union for the second time uh, uh, in my life and uh, met with Mr. Gromyko for a period of some three and a half hours. He was at his home uh, on the Black Sea, uh, swimming there with, with two of his uh, grandsons. And uh, he talked, I think, with genuine feeling about the possibility of just halting uh, nuclear development uh, on both sides. I realize, of course, that you know, conversation of that kind is a lot easier in the sunshine along the Black Sea than it is to hammer out the details of a verifiable and workable uh, arms control uh, agreement. But I believe such an agreement is possible if our leaders and the leaders on the other side are willing to live a little more with common sense and hope and a little less with hysteria and uh, paranoia. Some years ago, the uh, late President Eisenhower was on a uh, television interview with uh, Mr. McMillan, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, and he said this, I think the people of the world want peace so badly that someday their leaders had better get out of the way and let them have it. And that, I believe, is the greatest hope for the salvation of our civilization in this nuclear age. That was George McGovern, former senator from South Dakota, speaking at Smith College this past February. During the question and answer period that followed his address, McGovern was asked about his position during the election campaign that the U.S. should not withdraw some forms of aid to countries that are considered to be totalitarian. McGovern agreed that the U.S. should be more selective in the way assistance should be given out. Uh, I think with reference to food assistance and medical care, I would be very tolerant even of authoritarian uh, regimes in making that kind of aid uh, available. I realize that some of it's going to be stolen. Some is going to end up on the black market. Some is going to be a bootleg. But uh, in terms of humanitarian assistance, I think you can let down the standards a little on the theory that at least some of it gets through to the most vulnerable elements uh, in the country. So I would favor uh, food and medical assistance to uh, El Salvador, uh, to Nicaragua, uh, to uh, Ethiopia, uh, to the Philippines, uh, even where you have regimes that are personally obnoxious to me. Where I would, uh, where I would draw the, uh, where I would draw the line very uh, severely is on any kind of military assistance to a regime of that kind, or to broad-scale economic aid that can be used for budget support, which, as your question implies, is a way of diverting uh, money to pay for those things that frees up local resources for military uh, purposes. So I think I think we have to monitor our aid uh, very carefully. I also think that we'd be more effective if we funneled more of it through multilateral uh, agencies because they can set these tough standards uh, easier than we can. When we attempt to be too discriminating and rigid in the, in the guidelines we lay down as a condition 
of American aid, we get accused of economic imperialism and sometimes there's some validity to it. And you remove that danger insofar as you funnel aid through multilateral challenge uh, agencies such as the specialized agencies of the, uh, of the United Nations. McGovern was then asked what should the U.S. do to peacefully battle the ideological war between Washington and Moscow. He argued that the U.S. should always advance their view of how society should be organized. We tend to view a freer approach to the economy. It isn't always as free as we, we advertise, uh, and we haven't, always, uh, you know, uh, we haven't always been that careful about backing away from totalitarian uh, systems. But I do think it's legitimate in American foreign policy to try to reinforce our, uh, our way of, of life insofar as we, uh, as we can. Uh, but what I would argue is that I think we'll be more successful in doing that if we don't view the world as essentially a contest between ourselves and the Soviet Union. It's really not that, and that's not the way most people see it. Uh, I would say fully two-thirds of the people on this planet really don't give a hang about the Soviet-American uh, uh, contest. And uh, they, uh, they realize these big giants are going to be sparring with each other, but that's not their game. Uh, what, they're, what they're concerned about is the fact that a high percentage of their populations are up against starvation uh, or uh, rampant disease, uh, bad housing, the absence of roads and that kind of thing. And to whatever extent we can reinforce those concerns, I think we'll do better in terms of the way we're perceived. And that's, that's the kind of competition that we probably uh, can do very well with in terms of the Soviet Union. I don't think we can beat them militarily. I think they'll match us bomb for bomb, uh, plane for plane, tank for tank, and that on that score, they're probably uh, as good as we are. Uh, they're, they're pretty effective in terms of military uh, operation. They're willing to ship it around the world uh, as generously uh, as we are. So that uh, uh, what I'm pleading for here is a different view of how we uh, uh, strengthen America's uh, interests and, uh, and American uh, concerns around the world, and I think we do it better in terms of an intelligent policy, a diplomacy, and use of our uh, economic resources. Let me, if I can just take one more minute on that. You know, right now, we've got a really tragic agricultural crisis uh, in the United States. Our, our so-called family farmers are going broke uh, from coast to coast, and uh, one of the reasons is that domestic uh, farm prices are so depressed. Uh, we're finding it difficult to export because of the overvaluation of the dollar. Uh, and uh, so that there, there's, a, there's a virtual depression. I don't think that's too strong a word in agricultural America. And yet at the same time, we read where there are 20 million Americans who are hungry. This report came out this week. And 500 million people worldwide who are suffering from acute hunger. Now, why wouldn't it be an intelligent policy, both domestically and in terms of foreign policy, for us to help these American farmers and at the same time do something useful by uh, taking these surpluses uh, out of these storage bins and off the market and uh, doing what we can to end hunger, uh, both in this country uh, and around the world? I think that's the best argument against whatever appeal uh, Marxist Leninism has, that if you can show that we've got a system that uh, uh, can do more than just send our farmers into bankruptcy, that we have the wit to figure out how to save these farmers and at the same time use that abundance as a uh, constructive uh, foreign policy instrument, I think that's the kind of thing we ought to be, be doing. McGovern also criticized U.S. policy towards Chile which supports the regime of General Augusto Pinochet on the grounds that his government is the best hope against communism. I don't think Pinochet is a very good check against the uh, communist appeal in Chile. I think he probably creates more communists uh, than, he, uh, uh, than he checks. Uh, he's the kind of leader who drives people to desperation measures. 
Uh, if I really wanted to devise a strategy to get communism to look attractive to people, I'd give them Pinochet uh, <laughs> for a while uh, as the representative of capitalism and the friend of the United States, and we'd lose every friend we had in Chile in time if we keep our arms around Pinochet long enough because he obviously is not the wave of the future. He's a, he's a decadent uh, reactionary tyrant uh, who uh, has offended the most sensitive elements in his own country, and uh, this is the way he's always operated. That is not the kind of regime that the United States ought to hold up as a model of uh, either capitalism or freedom. I was appalled to hear Jean Kirkpatrick, uh, Ambassador, uh, Ambassador Kirkpatrick, as she was then, uh, uh, doing an interview on uh, television after being wined and dined by Pinochet, and the uh, American reporter who was interviewing her said, if you had to describe in one word what Pinochet is like, what you would say, and she thought for a while, and she said, well, I would say that he's a very nice man. <laughs> well, uh, he, he is not a very nice man. He's a miserable tyrant uh, who... Uh, by, uh, by uh, Jean Kirkpatrick standards, where, with her uh, bias in the direction of right-wing dictators, he may be a, uh, a nice man, but he's not nice in any real sense of the word. McGovern was then asked how it was possible to achieve a mutually verifiable nuclear weapons freeze with the Soviet Union, a concept which he endorses. Well, we have uh, technical means for doing that. Uh, I don't think any arms control agreement that we have yet negotiated depended on trust. Uh, as a matter of fact, you really wouldn't need an arms control agreement if the Soviet Union and the United States trusted each other. We, we don't require an arms control treaty with uh, Canada uh, or, uh, or with Mexico. But because we don't trust the Russians and they don't trust us, you have to have some kind of technically verifiable way of controlling this arms race. And that is the purpose of these satellites and other technical means that we have that enable us to identify everything they're doing on the nuclear front. Uh, I'm told, and I've seen some of the evidence of this, that this photographic intelligence that we have attached to our satellites enables us to actually read the numbers on a license plate in downtown Moscow. You can easily identify an object the size of this podium, and there's no way they could devise an additional strategic missile without us knowing about it. And they know the same thing about us. So I don't think the verification problem uh, is the key thing. Whether Sharon Yanko is sick or not, uh, is irrelevant uh, to the uh, technical capacity we have to know what they're doing. Also, you have to assume that if, uh, if either side enters into a nuclear freeze, they do it for selfish reasons. That being the case, what is the incentive to violate it? If it's in your self-interest to call a halt uh, to this continued uh, terribly expensive and dangerous arms race, uh, what is the selfish incentive in uh, violating something you've just said was in your interest enough to sign the treaty? And obviously no country is going to sign a treaty that's not in their selfish interest. McGovern was also asked to comment on the lawsuit against CBS by General Westmoreland and whether he believed Westmoreland was guilty of deliberately misquoting enemy strength. I, I think that... Uh, there was a lot of misleading going on in that period. General Westmoreland is far from being the most guilty uh, person on that score. What do you say about a president who for 14 months ran uh, aerial bombardment operations against Cambodia while denying it to the Congress of the United States and to the American people? I've always thought that one of the mistakes the House Judiciary Committee made in the Watergate uh, impeachment proceeding was dropping the uh, article of impeachment on the Cambodian bombing because this is one of the most flagrant violations of constitutional uh, and legal uh, authority that I know of. Uh, it, under oath, administration witnesses telling the Congress of the United States there were no 
American missions going against Cambodia, telling the press this. So General Westmoreland didn't invent deception. And uh, he, he, was, he was really following the lead of the commander in chief uh, and of others who deliberately misled the Congress and, dis and misled the American public. I suppose if General Westmoreland's sin was a little more sharp in some respects than others, it's the fact that he misled the president. The president was doing his share of the misleading too, but at least you would like to think the commander in chief has uh, uh, reliable reports on enemy strength and not have them uh, underestimated deliberately by a couple of hundred thousand uh, people. We might never have had the terrible trauma of the uh, Tet Offensive if we had known how many Viet Cong were actually uh, there. I have to tell you an interesting thing about that. I went to Vietnam and, um, several times during the war and one time when I was there we had gone through a number of briefings, including one by General Westmoreland, in which he was telling the troop strength of our side, uh, how many the South Vietnamese government had, how many militia forces they had, how many backup forces. And there was an American journalist with me, kind of a gruff television uh, executive in my state. And he said after one of these briefings, uh, Colonel, did you say that the uh, South Vietnamese Army with the help of the South Vietnamese militia actually has 800,000 soldiers in the field? The Colonel said, that's right. And my friend said, well, Colonel, I've been in this country now for two weeks. Where in the hell are they? <laughs> and this is the answer we got from American troops. That was way back in, uh, that was way back in early, uh, in the late 1960s and early uh, 70s that we were getting these estimates that turned out to be exaggerated on the side of our strength and underestimated apparently deliberately on the side of, uh, of what the uh, enemy forces were. So there was a lot of misreading going on and uh, efforts to put the best face on a, on a failing uh, enterprise. And I suppose people did that in some kind of misguided patriotism. They probably really thought, I'm sure General Moreland, Westmoreland thought he was really serving the national interest by withholding certain information that he thought would demoralize the war effort and probably result in a decision to pull out, which he didn't think was in the national interest. I don't think he saw himself as a traitor. I think he saw himself as a patriot that had to kind of spoon feed these politicians so they'd stay with him. That was George McGovern, former senator from South Dakota, addressing audience questions at Smith College in Northampton this past February 27, 1985. Earlier, we heard his address called Hope in the Nuclear Age. Often referred to as the conscience of the Democratic Party, McGovern has returned to academic life where he started his political career and teaches foreign policy at Duke University. George McGovern's appearance at Smith College was sponsored by the Smith Student Lecture Committee and his talk was recorded for WFCR by Charles Sennett. I'm Kari Jiri for Spectrum.